Thank you, Bernie. Thank you all for allowing us to be here this morning. I must confess to you, I am lost. <laughs> uh, we've been here before, but I don't remember all this remodeling that you did. The, the pews aren't wide anymore. The carpet's different. You've changed the platform around here. There's no pews. There's just chairs. There's no choir. <laughs> but the one thing that has remained is the love that we find here. And I am so preciously glad that uh, that has not changed. And we are delighted that we are here today to be with you. I have to tell you that I was uh, thinking several weeks ago, for some reason, the, the, the scene of the campus of Mac U uh, came to my mind where the river runs by it. How many of you have ever been to the campus there? It's beautiful. The banks of the river are just right there, grassy and down there. Anyway, so it, it, it made me think of how many rivers are mentioned in the Bible. And so I decided I would start a series of sermons called The Rivers of God. And uh, this sermon this morning is entitled, The River of Promise, uh, the Jordan River. Uh, if, I, if I were to um, say to you, if I would mention to you, in association with a river, the River Blue, what river might come to your mind? I didn't think you would. The Blue Danube. If I were to mention in association with a river, the word jungle, what river might come to your mind? Pardon? Amazon. The Amazon, good. If, if I were to, to mention to you in association with a, a, a river pyramids, the Nile. If I were to mention to you in association with rivers the name Jesus, what would you think of? The Jordan. The river of promise. I, I got to tell you, the, the, the river Jordan is inseparably tied to the history of Israel. It, it meanders 200 miles from Mount Hermon in the north down to the beginning of the, uh, the edge of the Dead Sea. Uh, now, if you were a crow, you could fly from where it started at Mount Hermon down to the Dead Sea, and it's only 120 miles. But it does. It meanders like that there. Do you know that it starts out at 1,500 feet above sea level? And by the time it gets down to the Dead Sea, it is 1,400 feet below sea level. It is the lowest land point on the face of the earth. And here, as uh, we start in Joshua, the first chapter, here we, we find the people of Israel standing or camped out on the east side of the Jordan River, they're getting ready to enter into the promised land. And they have a new leader because Moses is dead and Joshua's their new leader. And I, I think in your mind with me, you can just kind of picture jo Joshua standing there on the banks of the Jordan, looking wistfully across that water to the land that God had promised to the Israelites four decades before. Now Joshua's an old man when he's taken over this leadership. He was part of that original group of hundreds of thousands of people that left Egypt when God had redeemed them and sent them out there. He was one of the 12 tribes that went out to explore that new promised land of Canaan. And you remember the ten were brought back bad reports and 
Joshua and Caleb brought back good reports and said, we can do this there. He was um, one of those who wandered in the desert for 40 years. And at the end of the 40 years, he and Caleb were the only ones left of that original group. He'd seen people falling and dying in that 40 years' time. He ate the manna and uh, the quail during that time with all of the other Israelites. He was there when they had that incident with the, um, the brass serpent, when serpents were um, just... Uh, uh, I lost my word. Serpents were, were they're being punished, and, the, and they had snakes that were biting them. So they had formed this brass serpent, and God told them to look upon that. Anyway, he had been all of that, and now he was um, taking Moses' place. Anybody here ever stepped into the shoes of somebody else that was highly successful? And highly liked and admired. Anybody had that experience? Well, Joshua did. He was stepping into the shoes of Moses. The oral accounts and the written accounts of Moses' life state that at the time that he died, there hadn't been any leader like him. No one had ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses had done in the sight of the people of Israel. No one had been as humble as Moses. And now Joshua is taking his place. I, I, I really think that Joshua at this point in time must have felt as insignificant as chopped liver. But listen to what God had to say to him. It's very important that you hear these words, and you can read them on the screen. Moses, God said, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all of these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert and from Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates, all of the Hittite country, and to the great sea to the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all of the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. King James Version says, Be strong and have courage, because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers before them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all of the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not depart from it to the right or to the left so that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be able to and careful to do everything that's written in it. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wow. I don't know whether you noticed it, but one thought is repeated at least three times in those seven verses. It is a promise from God, our Creator, in five words. Four if you're reading it in the NIV here. Five if you're taking it from the King James Version. Be strong 
and to have courage to promise from God. And I want to tell you this morning that if you got problems, if you got obstacles in your life, if you've got things that are weighing you down, those words echo down through the sanctuary right into this very room today. And they were meant just for you. And, and if we look at them real closely, in, in the middle of all of these seven verses, there's a context there that those words exist in. Be strong and have courage. And I want to look at the context of those promises. For, for one thing, it's a promise that is heightened by the presence of obstacles. Now, you know, as you read the text or listened to it, that Joshua faced obstacles when God gave him this promise. He needed to get over two million people. That's about three times the size of Charlotte, North Carolina. He had to get two million people at least and all of their possessions and all of their livestock, that's the cattle, that's the sheep, that's the goats, that's the camels, that's the chickens, the geese, whatever else they had. Two million people plus all of those things and everything that they possessed, they had to get them across the Jordan River there. That's about as wide as uh, the Cape Fear, as we're getting close to the coast, or maybe the James River. And by the way, it's at flood stage at this particular time. And Joshua had to get them across there. You thought you had problems. <laughs> he had problems. <laughs> it reminds me, I read about this sign on a chaplain's door. It said in nice bold letters, if you have problems, you have troubles, come in and tell us about them. And then down at the bottom of it, it said, if you don't, come in and tell us how you do it. <laughs> well, we've been there, haven't we? But that's the point of my wanting to share this message with you. I think it would be very rare indeed if there's anybody here this morning that has not had obstacles in their life, have not had problems, have not had difficulties there. They're with us. And as God has promised Joshua, he has promised us, be strong and be courageous. I'm with you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to get through this with you. I was constantly in a church member uh, where we preached in uh, northern Oklahoma, and she was having a lot of problems. And as we were talking together, she said to me, Ron, I've got so many problems, I don't think I can handle any more. And I said to her very compassionately, Mary, the Lord won't allow any more than you can endure. She looked at me silently, and then finally she said, Well, I wish the Lord would tell me what my load limit is. <laughs> is that how you feel? I mean, maybe you've had it up to here. And you're tired of things not working out. One more disappointment. W one more conflict. One more demand. One more burden. And that's going to be the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. I got news for you folks. When you get to the end of your rope, do you know who you're going to find there? Jesus. He's there at the end of your rope. He may not take away your problems. That's not what God is saying to us. He may not take away those problems, but that's why that promise that he made to Joshua is so important for us today because he's with us in the midst of all of them. Isaiah 
recorded it so, so pointedly when he wrote in the 41st chapter, I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Say those last words together with me out loud. I will help you. Say them again. I will help you. Do you remember Paul's thorn in the flesh? We have no idea what it was, but whatever it was, it was severely disabling him. And he prayed to God fervently three times, Lord, take this thorn away from me. And you remember that God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Say those words with me. My power is made perfect in weakness. And later on, it's not on the screen, but later on, Paul would write to the Philippians and say, I can do all things, what? Through Christ who strengthens me or gives me strength there. God gives us the strength to get through these things. I remember hearing about a woodpecker that was pecking away one day at a dead tree. You know how woodpeckers do and They get that noise there. And as he was doing what woodpeckers do, a storm came up and lightning came down and struck that tree and splintered it in pieces. The woodpecker, standing back, kind of straightened his ruffled feathers and he looked at where the dead tree had once been and where it was now just splinters all over. And as he looked at it, he stood up like this and proudly proclaimed, some days a fella just doesn't know his own strength. <laughs> well, I've got to tell you, that's the way it is with us. We say it's impossible. God says all things are possible with me. We say I can't do it. God says, you can do all things through Christ. We say, I'm too tired. God says, come unto me, and I will give you rest. We say, I'm always worried and frustrated. And God says, cast all your cares on me. We say, I can't go on. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul writes later in the second Corinthian letter, the fourth chapter, and reminds us when he says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Far outweighs all of them that we have. Do you remember the song that we sing a lot? When peace like a river attendeth my soul when sorrows like sea billows roll. We get down to that last verse and it says, And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back like a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. And those last words of that song, Even so, it is well with my soul. A promise made right in the face of problems and difficulties. But that's not all these verses allow us to see. It's a promise that's confirmed by the unchanging character of God himself. Did you listen to those words where God says to Joshua, As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it, from Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus is saying to his disciples, and I guess he's saying it to us, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the ages. I guess what you need to understand, what I need to understand, is that God keeps his word to you. To me, to everyone, God keeps his word. It's in his very nature 
to do that. So be strong. Have courage. There are two books in the Old Testament that record the history of Israel. Actually, there's four. First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Sometimes they're just dusty, boring. Sometimes they're filled with some of the stories that we like to relate about the Old Testament. But nestled in First Kings, in the eighth chapter, there's a sentence that when we read through there, we often overlook it. It's up there on your screen there, where it is written, Praise be to the Lord, not one word has failed of all the promises that he gave. Isn't that awesome? Not one word. The book of Hebrews says he is faithful who has promised. He is God, the Father, the Creator, the Judge, the Redeemer. He's loving. He is perfect. He is powerful, fair, unbiased, compassionate, sovereign, eternal. <laughs> he knows everything. And he's present everywhere. And he's patient. Isaiah in another place reminds us when he says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He's promised to us that he's with us so be strong and have courage let me let me think with you about a promise when something's promised you haven't seen it until it happens right okay so What if I say to Bernie, you did a good job leading the singing this morning, Bernie, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you five dollars. Now I made the promise to him. But it hasn't happened yet, has it? It won't happen until I hand the five dollars to him. I'm just joking, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't happen unless you see it happen. That promise is the only evidence that we have. And I could prove very unreliable for one reason or another. But listen to me. God is trustworthy and true. His promises are more reliable than any evidence that you can see or touch or reason out. His promises are the unseen proof that give us our faith and assurance in our faith. As the book of Hebrews records, they are the unseen evidence that drives away all doubt. Our faith is certain of what we can see because of what we know God promises and he keeps his word. There is at the end of the Bible... In the Old Testament, the end of the Old Testament, there is this uh, book right before you get to Matthew called Malachi. Sometimes it's a boring one, too, to read. It's got all kinds of things. That's where we're, we're challenged to give a tithe in there when he tells us to test God. But what I like is in the third chapter, there is a sentence that says, I, the Lord, do not change. Our God never changes. And it's awesome. He, he taught the scientists everything he or she might know. 
He understood how the human body worked before the first doctor entered medical school. He composed the first songs before anyone whistled or hummed a tune. He understood justice before there were lawyers or courtrooms or law books before the first farmer cultivated a crop, he planted trees and grass and flowers. Before anyone ever said, I'm sorry, he planned a timeless scheme for forgiveness. And by the way, the universe was his pulpit before the first sermon was ever written. He's God. The psalmist was writing about him and said in the 102nd Psalm, you remain the same and your years will never end. God writes with a pen, folks, that never blots. He speaks with a tongue that never slips and he acts with a hand that never fails. You can depend on him, the one who is absolute. The book of Hebrews says Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He has never, never, never stopped making that promise to you. Be strong and have courage. I am with you. It's also a promise that's secured by adhering to the word of God. Listen to what he said again to Joshua. Don't let the book of this law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that's written in it. How many here can remember the first Bible you ever you ever had? Can you remember that? How many can remember that? How many of you still have the first Bible that you ever had? Wow, that's pretty cool. How many of you uh, served in the armed forces? Now, my dad was a, a Navy veteran in World War II. And when he came home, he shared with uh, we kids several things about his service, but the thing that I've never forgotten was he had in his possession a little pocket New Testament. You've seen the little pocket New Testaments, but this one had on the front of it a metal cover. Anybody seen one of those? Any of you veterans have ever seen one of those? I've never heard anybody that's ever seen one before. Do you know why that metal cover was over that New Testament? Yeah, save his life. They would wear them in their dungarees or in their jerseys, wherever they might be. They were supposed to have those New Testaments right there in that pocket. You know what that pocket covers? Your heart. It was to save their life. And I mention that to you because the Word of God has a very similar purpose in our lives today. We've memorized, most of us, that little verse in the Psalms that says, Your word have I, have I hid in my heart so that I may not sin against you. I know that most of you here this morning have probably had more sermons and more lessons about the Bible in your lifetime than I could ever preach. So I, I don't suppose I really can tell you any more about the Bible than what you already know, but I do want to remind you of this one fact. There's a huge difference in hearing what this says and doing what it says. And that's what God is saying to Joshua. Don't let this book of the law depart from your mind and your heart. Meditate on it and stuff like that. Um, James says, don't merely listen to the word, do what it says. I have to tell you, you don't have to like what this Bible says. You don't have to agree with what it says. But you do.
have to do what God says for you to do in the Bible there. God requires that you, you uh, follow what it says. Men across the ages have tried to ignore this. They've tried to argue with its teachings. They've even tried to destroy it. But generation follows generations, and here the book still exists there. Nations rise and fall, yet it remains. Kings, dictators, presidents, they come and go, and yet it's unchanged. It's condemned by atheists, and yet it continues to outlast every single one of them. It's scoffed at by scorners. It's exaggerated by fanatics. But it continues to have the last word. It is misconstrued and misstated, yet its integrity can never be disputed. I have to tell you, folks, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days of the week, we are told how... In, in, in the media, on television, in movies, in books, we're told how men and women are living in our day and age. This tells us how people ought to live. It remains a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It exists as a gate to heaven. It stands as a guide for children and for youth. It continues as a comfort for the aged. It endures as a rest for the weary. It prevails as a light for unbelievers. Some of you may have read some books by Elizabeth Elliot or know that she's the widow of a man along with four others who was martyred in the jungles of Ecuador in the 1950s. She wrote in one place, the will of God is not something that you add to your life. It's a course that you choose. You either line yourself up with the word of God or you capitulate to the principles that govern the rest of the world. I have to ask you, which of those sides do you line up on? George Barner, a guy that does a lot of uh, research about Christianity, had said one time, Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't even know what it says. And because they don't know and they don't do, uh, we become a nation of biblical illiterates. Do the word. I wonder which of those you might be and how you might be able to make changes in your life to study the Bible more, to read it more, or to do what it says where you have not done that. The river of Jordan, where we hear the promise of God. You ever have someone break a promise to you? You know how that feels? Or maybe they forgot that they made that promise. Depending on the promise that was made that was broken or forgotten, it hurts, doesn't it? Someone makes a promise to you and then they don't keep it. it hurts deep down there. Well, we've talked about the part of obstacles, God's character, in God's word, the part that they play in God keeping his promises. But just so the Israelites would not forget that God says to Joshua, you find 12 men, one from each tribe, and have them get a big boulder and stack them up here in the middle of the river. Sounds like a dumb thing to do, doesn't it? But God never does dumb things. He did it so that whenever the people saw them or 
got glimpses of the rocks, they would remember. They would not forget. And I'm here to tell you that God sets up for us two reminders so that we won't forget in the currents of our life there. He understood that maybe there would be people that would wonder and doubt maybe that God would not keep his promise. So he sets these two reminders up in the currents of our life. One is an empty cross and the other is an empty tomb, both reminding us of his great promise of eternal life. Many years ago when people traveled across the oceans by boats, a missionary and his wife who had spent their whole life on a foreign mission field were coming home to the United States. And as the ship docked in New York, it turned out that uh, a person of great uh, celebrity was on that ship. And as his entourage came down the gangplank down at the bottom were great big bands. And the bands were playing and the people were waving flags and cheering and stuff. And as the missionary and his wife came down the plank, nobody was there to greet him. And the missionary silently prayed, Dear God, we've spent our life serving you. We've sacrificed. We've done the best we know how. He gets this kind of tribute. We get nothing. It doesn't seem fair. And the Lord signed a whispered into his heart, wait a minute, you're not home yet. And I have to say to you this morning, no matter what you're going through, no matter how you feel, God's made a promise to you that he's with you and you're not home yet. Jesus made sure that there's a way for you to get home when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And if you're here this morning and you maybe have been in church, uh, you maybe this is your first time, I don't know, but maybe it's occurring to you that you need Jesus. If it's not occurring to you, I'm telling you, you need Jesus as your Savior. He made it simple, but at the same time costly. All you need to do is just stand and say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But when you do that, that's your pledge of allegiance to Jesus and to the Bible. He, he, he asks you to turn your life around with his help. It's called repentance. And he says, I want you to be buried in the waters of baptism and rise in the newness of life. And nothing magical about the water, I have to tell you that. Sometimes it's even real cold. And I've had one experience where it was too hot. But it's not the water, it's the obedience. It's participation. There's only two times that you and I can participate in Jesus' death. One is at the Lord's Supper, and one is when we're buried with him in baptism. And we rise to walk in the newness of life, hanging on with every word to the promises of God until we go home. Do you need to make that decision? this morning or maybe you just need to as a Christian you need to say Jesus don't ever leave me trust on his help it's there for you we're going to stand and sing this invitation song together <laughs>